Back to week two of our series, Parenting in the 21st Century. I'm Pastor Tim. Hey, let's welcome Church Online, our campuses. So glad you guys are here. You know, kick off the fall, we're taking a look at parenting and family dynamics from a biblical perspective. And last week, you know, we kicked off just by acknowledging a, a universal truth about all the families represented in our church, listening online in this room. And the first is this. You didn't choose your family, did you? <laughs> like, we all grew up in these different types of homes different types of moms and dads, some there, some not, some with single parents, some with annoying siblings, right? And you didn't choose them. It's kind of like you get what you get, you don't get upset. And the second truth is, no matter how good your family was, your family wasn't perfect, were they? There are no perfect families in this church, okay? We do have some, you know, traditional families. We have some blended families. We have single folks. We have grandparents who are raising kids, we have people with adult children living at home, families where mom and dad both work and are totally stressed out, and, and none of them are perfect, including the families of your pastors, by the way. In fact, can we have a little fun? Can we have a little fun just to start? I want to show you some pictures of our pastors when they were kids. You ever wonder what your pastors looked like back in the day? Let's see if you can tell which pastor this is. Let me show you the first one. Anyone want to take a guess on this? Anybody? That is Pastor Denise from Mountainside. Look at that. Come on amazing. And how about this next one? Take a look. Again, this is a campus pastor. I don't want to take a guess. That is Pastor Chris Capua in Summit. Look at him all grown up, right? You can't believe it. Now this one, I bet you're going to get. Anyone want to guess which pastor this is? Anyone guess? That is Pastor Kyra. And you can tell, right? I mean, come on. She's already got bows and pink skirts and jewelry back in the day, all right? It also, <laughs> how about this one? This one is always kind of fun because you look at him then, and here's Pastor Phil now, not a lot of difference, right? Actually, not a lot has changed there. And uh, this one, you might be able to tell from the ears, anybody, middle, uh, middle sex. Hello, Pastor Paul Benjamino. Yeah, look at that, man, adorable. All right, last one, last one. Anyone want to guess who, which pastor this is? Pastor Kyler from Church Online. But what you may not know is he was the model for Elf on a Shelf. Isn't that incredible? That's so weird. Can we hear from all of our pastors? <laughs> Hard to believe we were once kids too, right? And now most of us are parents. In fact, check this out. You want to guess how many kids we have in this church? Like across all of our campuses. You know how many children? 829 kids and students last Sunday, okay? Let's give, give a praise for our liquid family volunteers, our dream teamers. Guys, that is seven times the size of just the average church in America, okay? So we're blessed. We have seen 262% growth year over year. So in other words, we have doubled two and a half more times kids and students than this time last year. So God is doing something special here at Liquid. He's literally leading the generations through our doors. We want to steward that really well. Um, I had a chance to visit some Liquid family classrooms in the summer. Holy moly. Uh, there were 80 kids in middle school at one of the services. Um, it was a little bit bonkers. Uh, elementary was packed. The nursery kind of busting at the seams with babies. So absolutely incredible. I just want to let you know, this isn't normal, okay? So praise God, you're part of a church that is booming with kids and students, amen? And that's why I want to share a message today because everyone in this room has relationships with children, right? Some of you are parents with sons and daughters, all the way from toddlers to teens. Some of you are brothers and sisters or a grandma or grampy or a step-parent, uh, or maybe you're a teacher in liquid family, okay, or a group leader for our kids. I think we could all use a little encouragement when it comes to influencing children for the Lord. Now, last week, I told you there were two things every family needs to flourish. Do you remember what they are? Can you call them out? It was love and anybody? Discipline. Yeah, love and discipline. Two twin chambers of the heart of Abba, God the Father, the only perfect parent you'll ever have. The Bible says this, the Lord disciplines those he loves. In other words, if you want to raise secure kids, confident kids, kind kids, they need to feel love. That is, they need to feel the warmth, the affection, the empathy, the nurture on the one hand. But on the other hand, they also need 
limits. That's the discipline. It's the, the, the self-control you teach. It's the boundaries you set. And when kids break those boundaries, the goal of loving discipline is to teach your child to repair the relationship. So it's not really about breaking the rules. It's about restoring the relationship. And this is like a life skill that they're going to need for a successful marriage, uh, in the workplace, friendships, raising their own families one day. But here's the catch. Love and discipline look very different depending on the stage of your kids, doesn't it? Like those of you who are training a toddler, right, who's teething, that's really different than coaching a teenager who's driving, okay? So today, I want to teach you about the four stages of parenting. So I'm going to kind of write on the board today. If you want to take notes, you want to take some pictures. And the first really is called the, the discipline years. And this is the age of really birth all the way through age five, the discipline years. Everyone say discipline. Show of hands. Who's got kids between one month and five years old? Okay. I see you. I see the little spit up on your shoulder. Okay. Some of you are like, I'm too tired to raise my hand. Okay. I get it. Days are long uh, and, and hard. And those of you with newborns know this. I get it. You're not worried about how to raise a tween. You're just like, I want to survive the terrible twos. This stage is really all about keeping the child alive. Okay. So great job. If you got him here to church today, it's about laying down limits, right? And, and teaching like the basics, like in this house, we don't throw food, right? We don't stick the fork in the socket. For the first five years, you're basically bodybuilding. You're strengthening your child's obedience muscle by setting down consequences. And parents with littles, I feel your exhaustion. But I just want to assure you, as one who's been through all these stages, okay, the days are long, but the years are short. It's only five years until what are called the training years. Everyone say training. And this is really ages uh, six, I would say, through about 11, right around 12 years old. Show of hands, who has school-age kids, elementary, okay? And this is a little bit different because in the discipline years, if you're explaining the what, training is the why, the why behind the rules. Lean in, son. Listen, here's why you never ask a lady if she's pregnant, okay? Let me tell you why. It's not polite, and this is what's going to happen, okay? You train while you explain, and you help them practice good choices and turn them into habits. Now, Discipline looks a lot different, right, if you're the mom of a middle schooler and, and your kid's raging with hormones on the doorstep of independence because suddenly kids bigger than you and, you know, the wooden spoon or chancleta doesn't look so intimidating. And that is because you are entering what's called the coaching years. Everyone say coaching. Put me in, coach. This is really some of the most difficult years because these are the ages of 13 through 17 where they enter middle school and you're going to coach more than you correct. They're different. Because your kids are gaining independence, right? Middle school parents, they're picking their own friends. They're picking their own music. They're, they're, they're choosing what they like to do. So if this is the what, this is the why, this is the how you do it. You actually come alongside as a coach. And here's the trick. If you don't know how to coach your kid in, 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 their, in their teens, you don't know how, how to win hearts, not arguments, oh, it's game over, <laughs> because you will never get to the fourth stage. And the fourth stage is a beautiful stage, if you can get there with God's help, and that is the stage of friendship. Everyone say friendship. This is now, your kids are 18 plus, they're launching out on their own for school or vocation, and they're gonna be adults for the rest of their lives. The question is, can you have an adult-adult peer relationship? Quick show of hands, how many of you have kids over the age of 18? They're, they're in college or maybe adults themselves, okay? This stage is actually where Colleen and I are right now. We have been through each of these stages, and now we are empty nesters. Here's a photo of our kids, right, when they were little. This is when they were in the, uh, the training stage here. You can kind of see we were at an Egyptian museum or something like that. But here they are this summer. Look at this, okay? My daughter turned 21. She's a college senior. My son turned 19, and he stopped wearing shirts. That's just, his not, he just, he doesn't wear shirts anymore. He's, he's a freshman at Liberty University down in Virginia. We're majoring, hopefully, in wearing a shirt one day. We have high hopes. We, we drove both these guys to college this fall, and then we dropped them off. And um, it's been fun because people ask, they're like, hey, you know, what's it like being empty nesters? And I can tell you, let me be honest, okay? First week, you walk around the house crying. Second week, you walk around the house naked. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Well, sorry. I, I got to beat that woman off with a stick. I'm like, call him not a piece of meat. Leave me alone. <laughs> but our God is keeping it real. Listen, our goal the last 20 years, okay, is that, you know, once our kids launch, 
once they leave the house, once they flew the nest, our goal is that we established enough trust with them. Watch this. That one day they would voluntarily choose to come home and spend time with us even when they didn't have to. That one day, look at this, that we would be friends one day, actually like each other because of the bonds that we built here. And this is really important because when our kids were little, okay, we actually came up with a family mission statement. Colin and I kind of did together, but we, we wrote it combined with them. And this was our family mission statement. In the Lucas home, this is what we said we want to do. We said we want to, our kids to grow up to be kind, compassionate, responsible adults who love Christ, share God's heart for the world, and then use their gifts to serve others. But now watch this. And then we want to be friends. That was the family mission statement we wrote 21 years ago. And it really gives shape and direction to the choices we made as parents. It really sets our priorities. Now, I want you to notice what this doesn't say. Notice it doesn't say we want our kids to be valedictorians at school. It doesn't say we want our children to have a killer instinct and play Division I sports. It doesn't even mention a, a certain career path, like you should be a minister or something. It doesn't mention making money or buying a big home in the, in, in the nice neighborhood. Not because those things aren't nice things. They're just not our priority. They're not our number one goal on the list. Notice again, put it up on the screen. Our outcome is not aspirational, it's relational. We want our kids to grow up to be kind, compassionate, responsible adults who love Christ, share God's heart for the world, use their gifts to serve others, put it up on the screen, and then we want to be what? Friends. Not hard. We want them to love God, love others, and then maybe, maybe, maybe one day, love us. Wouldn't that be nice, parents? (laughs) Like if you survive all the drama and all the trauma of these stages, one day you could have this with your kids, like friendship as they become adults and one day start families of their own. Now let me warn you about the biggest mistake that I see parents make as a pastor. The biggest mistake I see parents make is they want to be friends with their kids and they try to be friends here when they should be disciplining their kids here, here, and correcting them through coaching here. What happens is parents get very lax with the discipline in elementary years because like, I want to be friends with my middle schooler. I want to be the cool mom. And so they try to, then when it goes out of control, they try to clamp down in the high school years. Oh, listen, if you spend the first dozen years and you start neglecting discipline and then you crack the whip in high school, woo, good luck, game over. So today I just want to teach you one thing that you can do at each age and stage. So you've got a shot with God's help at friendship later in life. Because like, there's a lot of things you could say about each stage, but I'm only gonna teach you one today for each one that was particularly impactful for our family. And it's not because we're experts, we're not perfect. Colleen and I made a ton of mistakes, but there's really four or five core practices that God taught us that we want our kids to carry on. So I'll start here with the discipline stage. The first stage, again, it's about survival. If you've got little ones under five, you've got to keep it simple. And I would just encourage you as a pastor to create what we called a family rhythm. Can you say family rhythm? Family rhythm. Just just establishing a daily structure necessary so your kids can flourish. Because here's the deal, leaning mom, your kids know you love them. They know in their hearts, but they feel your love through your calendar. The reality is we all lead these crazy, insane, busy lives in the Northeast with work and school and sports and all this stuff. But this is all about loving your kids with your calendar in the early years. What are those priorities in your family schedule that really communicate love to your child? So for us, dinner time, that was like the anchor of the Lucas family rhythm. Um, When our kids were little, we ate dinner together as a family. Our goal was to do it three to four nights a week, okay? Some nights I might have to be out or Colleen has to travel, but three or four nights a week because that's where we connected and we caught up in the day. We actually had a no screens at the table rule. Anybody have that? Hold to it, man. Dinner has to be distraction free, even if it's only like 15 minute dinner because that's where we would debrief the day with our kids. And so we started a little tradition um, when my daughter entered first grade, um, because you know, kids come home and like, how was school? Good, you know, what'd you learn? Nothing, you know? And so I turned it into a thing and it's kind of silly. We made up a song for it. It goes like this, it goes, it's time for 30 second story. It's time for 30 second story, here's Chase. And then you had to tell a 30 second story And like, I was an English guy, so I was like, you got to add color and drama. There's got to be like a conflict and extra points for humor. 
And so Chase would be like, okay, so there's a new girl in our class and she came into lunch and she had her lunch tray and she wasn't sitting with anyone. And I waved her over and she sat down with us. And I'm like, woo, we're doing it. Look at this kind, compassionate kids, you know? Do you want to go, son? And it was just really funny because my son would use 30 second story to tell on himself. But he didn't know how, like he didn't know how to do it. So he'd be like, well, Jack was really naughty today. And we're like, go ahead. He's like, yeah, recess, recess, Jack said like a four letter word to the teacher. And we're like, are you Jack? And we're like, no, no. He put me in a headlock for no reason. <laughs> we're like, really, for no reason. He's like, yeah, all, all I said, Dad, all I said, you're annoying while I was punching him in the stomach. I said, you're annoying. And next thing you know, he has me in a headlock. <laughs> and dinner time, it just became this critical connection point for our family because it's where we bonded, connected, corrected. There was laughter, there'd be tears. We talk about choices. It's where our family really let down their hair and we could hear what's on the hearts of our kids, what's really going on. It's part of our family rhythm. And so we guarded that time jealously. Now, the second priority we set in the discipline years is that we were very committed to celebrate the Sabbath together. We observed what the Bible calls the Sabbath, okay? Every week, our family would take a 24-hour period, whole day, basically, where we didn't do any work, we didn't do any schoolwork, no chores. We just had fun together. And this actually cuts from you're like, that sounds great. It comes from the Bible. It comes from Exodus chapter 20. When God the Father is teaching his children, the Israelites, he's like, I want to teach you about the importance of rest in a weekly rhythm. And here's what God says. He says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. He said, six days, you shall labor. You're going to do all your work. You're going to go crazy. But the seventh day is a Sabbath or a rest to the Lord your God. And then he says this, on it, you shouldn't do any work, neither you nor your what? Your son or your daughter. I want this to be a family day. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. He's again, look at me. But even I, the perfect parent, I rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy, set apart. Guys, this is so important that your heavenly father, your Abba, he made it part of the Ten Commandments. So it's like this spiritual boundary marker for families. No work, no school. We rest, we unplug, and we simply be. We have 24 hours where the focus is on simply being a family. So for our kids, they loved it because we'd go to the park, we'd take a hike in the woods, we'd you know, show how to carve a pumpkin or catch a snake. Our Sabbaths were always intentionally analog. So you weren't allowed to do email, screens, even, even TV. Don't waste the Sabbath binging or numbing out. It's about act, engaging with one another. I remember taking our kids to the, uh, the swing set behind our house one Sabbath. Again, simple stuff. And other parents are there, and they're swinging their kids. And you know how, you know, you're kind of sitting in there, and you're pushing your kid back and forth, pushing your kid. And I look down the row, and literally everyone's like this. They're on their phones. Like, we're, we're, we're in proximity to our kids, but we're not present in the way that matters most. And so God institutes the Sabbath, I think, as the antidote for MFD. You know what MFD is? Mad family disease. We're Friday you run a taxi service, right, mom or dad? You go to sports games and practices, and then we got to get to the concert and back in time for the travel team. And, and in New Jersey, guys, I'm just telling you, it's like an arms race to see how busy you can make your kids. But the Sabbath, God, he's like, don't go like the rest of the world. Live counterculturally. God says, I want to give you a gift, a whole day. And typically it was Saturday, right? Or for us, Christians, Sunday, Saturday for Jews, where they enjoy relationship with me, God, and with each other. Now, growing up and still today, my Sabbath is typically Friday. I work Sunday through Thursday, basically, right? So I was always around on Fridays when our kids would get out of school and the weekend started. And early on, I loved it because our kids knew, oh, oh, when, when Sabbath starts, daddy's home. And they were like this, no more liquid. They knew like liquid I wouldn't talk about. They're like, daddy's here to play with me. And so, we, you know, we'd shoot baskets in the driveway, build Legos, go for a bike ride. And we really taught them to look forward to the Sabbath. And when they were in first and second grade, I think it really clicked for them because I remember picking them up from school. And you ever go to pick up, you know, with your kids? And I'm standing there with the other parents at pick up, whatever. And my son comes bursting out of the door of school and he comes out, he's got his backpack and he goes, Daddy, it's Sabbath time. <laughs> and all the parents, like, are looking over me. They're like, are you, are you Jewish? You're like, I, I thought you were a priest. I guess he's a rabbi. I don't know what that is. Our family Sabbath was like the center of gravity around which everything else orbited. And so we guarded it religiously because MFD will gobble it up. 
and it helped focus us on connecting with each other and with God. Yes, on Sunday, on, on the Sabbath, part of our weekend, we would go to church. And you know what, par- parents? That's a big deal, right? Like it's a sacrifice. Like I get it. Sometimes it's a pain in your tuchus to get here, isn't it? Right? Anybody? When you got little kids, let's not pretend like it's all holy. Getting to church, let's say, could be a nightmare. They're like crying. You're spilling Cheerios. Where's my, you know, my Stanley mug? You know, get the minivan. It's like you're not, you like lose your Christianity on the way to church, right? <laughs> but let me just tell you something. Whatever sacrifice it takes, parents, it's worth it. Because the most significant predictor of a child's spiritual development, their walk with Jesus as an adult, you know what the most predictor is it? It's how committed were their parents and how authentic was their faith and whether or not they served and did church together as a family. So I guess I want to pledge something to you. We will never waste your time on Sundays in this church. We are building something eternal here through Liquid Family and High School. Our goal is that this day, this hour would be the best hour of your kid's week and the most helpful of yours. The Sabbath is serious stuff, parents, and that's why God put it at the heart of the Ten Commandments. And I'm not telling you this because like, I'm a pastor. You're like, hey, you got to come to church. But I'm just like, where else are you going to have these vital conversations? Like, like, where else are your kids going to learn biblical truth? In school? I don't think so. Where are you going to get to serve the poor together as a family? That's what the church is for. And you've got a very short window in these first five years before you get to the training stage where it's really about communicating clear expectations, right? God has 10 commandments, but we're like, our kids, 10 commandments. Can we whittle it down to three that they'll remember? Like when our kids were little, we're like, you know, they're three years old. We don't have to worry about murder yet. Maybe in middle school, but like, and so in this stage, I'm just a big fan of keeping things simple. And so in the Lucas home, we had three main rules and we called them the three Ds, you know, get it, three Ds. I actually got this from Andy Stanley. The first was dishonesty. We said, you know what? Lying in our home is just going to be unacceptable because it's breaking trust. And so our kids knew, hey, you need to always, even if it's bad, you're always going to tell the truth because it's going to get worse if you lie, right, to mom or me. So dishonesty. Second was defiance. You know, it's, it, when I say defiance, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like it's one thing if you're like, you know, you tell your kid like, hey, turn off Minecraft and go brush your teeth. And you come back in 10 minutes and they're still Minecrafting. And you're like, oh, please, 10 more minutes. Come on, dad. That's not defiance. Defiance is, hey, can you turn off Ma- Minecraft? They're like, no. <laughs> and they turn into Gollum, right, from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like, now, now we've got a problem because that's a spirit thing. That's a spiritual thing. And the third was disrespect, okay? Dishonesty, defiance, and disrespect. We said, you've got to show respect to adults and your brother or your sister. And I know it's, it's, it's a struggle with siblings, right? Like, you've got to be creative. I, I saw this one genius mom. She came up with a fun idea online. Whenever her kids were fighting with each other, she'd make them wear what she called the get-along shirt. <laughs> That's just sort of genius. Look at the look on their faces. Whenever they would fight, you've got to wear the get-along shirt until you truly get along. But again, for us, we had these three Ds in our house. No dishonesty, no disrespect, no defiance. And it's funny because my son and I were driving the car one time and we're talking about the three Ds. And I'm like, just remember, son, right? Don't lie. And he's like, yeah, I know. No disrespect. And he says, dad, I, I think you're missing one. And I'm like, really? You want another rule? And he's like, yeah, don't worship the devil. So we made a fourth. Now we have dishonesty, defiance, respect, no devil worship in our house. Okay, we had very high bar, okay, in the pastor's house. So <laughs> the, the, my point is, when your kids break the boundaries, and they will, that little sinner, you got to correct him or her with compassion, okay? With empathy and love. If, if you discipline out of anger, and P.S., we all have, we all have, including me. It doesn't make your kid better. It makes them bitter. And that's why Paul wrote in Ephesians. He said, fathers, do not what? What's it say? Exasperate your children. He says, instead, bring them up and they'll, ooh, look at that. Training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I want to be clear. This applies to all parents. But you notice Paul speaks first to fathers. Remember last week, dads, I told you your words weigh 500 pounds. They just They just do. And if you correct your kid sharply, why are you doing, what's wrong with you? Don't do that. And you don't have the love. You don't have the empathy. You don't have the compassion. You will not crush the rebellion. You will crush their spirit. No more Mario. Go to your room. Xbox in the garbage. So watch this. You win the battle, but you lose their heart. And this is where the gospel is so essential, guys. Remember, 
God is your father, so Abba is your example. And I want you to think about this. How does your Abba respond when you sin, when you disobey? Does he, does he lash out in anger? Does he shame you? No. The gospel, the good news says that, you know what? When we sin, it's not just that we're breaking the rules, we're breaking God's heart. And because it's about relationship and he loves you so much, he says, I'm going to, watch this, I'm going to side with you against your sin. Out of love, God says, oh no, Tim, what a poor choice. There's going to be consequences, but let me help you. In other words, Jesus takes all of our guilt, he offers up forgiveness, and then he restores the relationship. So as God's child, you're forgiven, you're accepted, but there's still consequences on earth, right? So let me show you how it works. As a father, when my son confessed, no, I was just, you know, I just was punching Jack in the stomach because he was annoying and I wouldn't do anything, you know. Instead of getting angry, what do you tell you about touching kids? You know what he did? I said, oh, no, son, I'm, so, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Re remember, it's disrespectful to punch others. Oh, no. Now you're not going to be able to play Minecraft with Michael on Saturday. And he's like, no! <laughs> and I'm like, I know. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry, son. I, I wish this had happened to you. I know you'll do better next time, though. Now watch. Do you see what I did there? I was siding with my son against his sin. He's not the problem. His sin is. And when you correct with compassion, watch this, you side with your child. Oh, no, you lied. Oh, gosh, I hate the consequence for dishonesty. It tells them you reject their sin, but you still embrace them. So a loving parent will correct with compassion, not harshly, never in anger. See, every family fights, but there's a world of difference when you fight for your child, not with your child. Yeah? When you fight with your child, you know what happens? Walls go up. But when you fight for your child, not with them, walls come down, relationship deepens. So you got to win hearts, not arguments. That's good. Say win hearts. Not arguments. So mom or dad, that means you may need to take a step back when things get heated at home, but never give in. Even though she goes to her room and she slams the door and she says, I hate you. They need to know you will stay in the room and fight for them. So they may close their door, but don't you, mom, don't you, dad. Dad, even if you're divorced, you keep fighting for a relationship with your daughter. Even if your son rebels, you don't reject him. You don't walk away. When they break trust with you, and they will, you need to show you can be trusted to fight for their heart. And that will get you to the coaching years. Ah, middle school. Who can smell it? <laughs> Smells like Doritos and feet. This is where, <laughs> this is where the hormones kick in, right? This is the age, the right, adolescence, puberty starts, right? So now they're starting to grow hair and, and you've got a moody teen who's always like eye rolling and you know, skulking around the house. And I was trying to think of a spiritual way to say this, but there's really no other principle you can say for this stage. Here it is. You ready? Don't freak out. Okay. That, <laughs> isn't that spiritual? <laughs> Colleen taught me this when our daughter turned 10. And I always, I actually can remember. There she is. You can see when she was little, look at her, she's a little Starbucks thing for Halloween, whatever. But um, yeah, we did celebrate Halloween, judge me, all that. We just, okay, we did it. All right. But <laughs> she, Colleen took me aside and she said, okay, now she goes, honey, I just wanted to go out with you. You can put down the picture. She says, um, Things are going to be changing now that our kids have hit puberty. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, I think, I think she's, she's talking about having the talk. And then I realized she was having the talk with me. <laughs> she's, she's like, I just don't want you to freak out because there's going to be a lot of hormones in the house for the next few years, and you and I need to keep the lines of communication open. Do you understand? I was like, yeah, keep communication lines open. And I'll be honest, I was a little offended because, like, hey, I'm a, I'm a decent communicator, and she's like, but honey, you get weird about this stuff. And she was right. In my house growing up, they were, we were a little uptight. My parents never said the word sex. They'd actually, whenever they said it, they would spell it out. They'd be like, you know, we want to talk to you about S-E-X. <laughs> <laughs> right? But Colleen intuitively gets this stuff. And, and she would, the stuff she would get these fifth grade girls to tell her was amazing. She'd be driving them home from volleyball practice. There's four middle school girls in the back seat, and they're talking, they're texting away. <laughs> And she's like, all right, girls, I want to know all the dirt. Who likes who? And they'd be quiet and they'd be like, oh. Jimmy tried to kiss Katie. And no matter what those girls would tell her, she goes, just look straight out the windshield and don't freak out. 
I was like, do you don't freak out? She's like, yeah, just keep asking questions. And so Kyle would be like, real, what did she do? And, and, and she's like, never comment out, just ask questions. And so they don't know any better and they would tell her all this stuff. And so one time they said, Miss Lucas, do boys really, they're like, do, you, do they really care if you shave your armpits? <laughs> you know, and she would tell them the facts and she'd tell them the truth because they trusted her not to judge or try to teach. And so Kyle's like, she says, Tim, most important thing at this stage is the kids know they can trust you. Now everyone say trust. Trust is absolutely critical. In fact, I'm going to say something provocative. There's a book called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity by Reggie Joyner. And uh, he wrote this. He said, too often, parents think that their primary goal is to get their children to follow the rules. But during the formative and teenage years, look at this, it's actually more important for parents to earn trust with the child than for the child to earn trust with the parents. Now, I'll be honest, when I first read that, I was like, well, this is a misprint. (laughs) This seemed backwards. I was like, no, they need to earn trust with me. And that is true. But watch, at the coaching stage, it's the other way around. This is a ninja move. It is vital for you, mom or dad, to prove to your child you can be trusted. Because at this moment, they are testing brave new waters. They're trying out new clothes. They're listening to new music, new friends, new language, new identities. And more than ever, they need a trusted adult to stay cool and composed when they're feeling insecure. And this is like the key to effective coaching. Coaching is about coming alongside and just asking the right questions. And this is critical in middle school and high school because here's the deal. Developmentally, look at this. They're out of the discipline stage and the training season. They're gone. And they need a parent who won't freak out and can help them navigate the trickier waters of adolescence. Because parents, I'm just telling you, I guarantee, I have a prophetic word for you. You are going to see a text you don't like, right? You're going to see it on their phone. You're going to see a picture come up or a social post that raises all sorts of flags. And you're not going to like it. But how you respond in that moment, whether you overact, give me that phone. Who is it? Or you don't freak out will be decisive for your child in deciding whether or not they can trust you with that conversation. In these years, Colleen kept telling me, honey, don't freak out. And when in doubt, just ask questions. I'll end with this story. So I remember, I'm like, okay, got it. Don't freak out. I remember middle school, I go pick up our daughter from practice and um, she hops in the car and it's just me and her. She didn't have her friends with her. And uh, she's like, hey, dad. I was like, hey, how was practice? She's like, oh, pretty good. You know, and of course she goes right back on her phone, you know. And as she's got her phone, I see her kind of like scrunch her nose and she goes, ew. And I'm, you know, I'm driving her home. I'm like, what, 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 what is it? And she's like, I just, my friend's going shopping for something icky with her mother. And I'm like, I'm like, what? What's, what's she shopping for? And she's like, nothing. Don't worry about it. I was like, come on, you can tell me. I'm like, I'm going to be Bond, you know. And, and she kind of giggles, and she kind of blushes. And she's like, well, if you must know a training bra, dad, she's going to, she's going to buy a training bra. And I'm just driving Look it out the windshield, and you can see my knuckles turning white. And I'm like, thanks a lot, Carl. I walked into that one. But then I hear in my, my ears saying, you know, don't freak out, Tim. Keep asking questions. And so my daughter, she, like, kind of glances over at me to see, like, my reaction. I'm just staring straight ahead. I was like, oh, a training bra? Wow. How cool. What? Who says that? Right? And she's like, she kind of, like, looks at me sort of weird. She's like, not real. I was like, no, no, that's cool. Do you have other friends getting training bras? And now she's like, what, dad? And now I'm all nervous and calls like, no, keep asking questions. And I'm like, I'm nervous. I'm like, well, no, honey, honey, these are important milestones. Like training bras and periods. What about periods? What am I saying? I, um, do, they, do you have periods yet? Ah! Her mouth just dropped. And fortunately, we're like pulling in the driveway. And I'm like, well, we're home. And she like runs out of the car. It's like it was on fire. And I walk in after her and Colleen's just like, hey, honey, where did it? She's like, what'd you do? I was like, I, I don't know. I'm just asking questions, you know? I, it's like middle school. There are really no Bible verses for this stage. I don't even have a scripture for you. Comfort the afflicted. It do, don't freak out pretty much covers it, okay? Now, obviously, a lot more, a lot, you know, I'm making it in light of that, but I don't, because a lot more can be said here. And I want you to know, we're going to say a lot more next Sunday at our parent summit. Uh, it's a specially designed event for parents of elementary, middle school, and high school students. In fact, um, you should have gotten a card on the way in today at our campuses. And you can see it's next Sunday night, 
September 24th from 5.30 to 8.30. It's at our broadcast campus in Parsippany. And parents, Colin and I are going to be there. We're going to provide dinner for you guys. And our team, our next-gen team, our Liquid Family team, um, we want to serve on you, love on you. And then here's the deal. I'm going to give you a brief biblical overview of sexual ethics, what the Bible actually teaches about sexual orientation and gender roles. So if you're navigating some, maybe some of these tricky conversations about LGBTQ uh, with your child, we want to help you do that with compassion. Like, how, again, how do we communicate truth, but actually have a tremendous amount of grace and empathy. Because for Gen Z, this is a critical and complex issue, okay? I'm actually going to be interviewing an expert, Art Pereira, who specializes in helping families with LGBTQ kids. And then the second session, we are going to tackle the topic of anxiety and depression among teenagers. Because mental health has really complicated this for middle school, high school years. Will Hutcherson will be here. He wrote a book on helping heal depression among teens. So it's really going to be a great night. I think we're going to have very candid, practical sessions on both sexual identity and mental health. So I encourage you to sign up on our mobile app or online for next Sunday night. And then next Sunday morning, in our final week of the series, we're going to talk about how you can redeem the screen, right? Like we can't talk about parenting in the 21st century without talking about technology. Like what age should you give a kid their first phone? right? Some of you are like, maybe 18. <laughs> How about social media, TikTok? Some of you are like, never. <laughs> Good luck. How do you limit or set guidelines for screen time? Asking for a friend, right? So Pastor Zach's going to tackle that topic next Sunday morning, and then Pastor Kyra and I are going to discuss sexual identity and mental health at the Parent Summit at night. Guys, our goal is that if you can navigate this, watch this, if you can somehow, with God's grace, navigate the discipline, the training, the coaching years, by God's grace, one day, you may have a shot at this. Parents, listen to me. Friendship with your adult children is possible. But like any relationship, it takes work. But you know what? That's what your father, God, offers you. He offers you help. I want you to listen. I'll close with this, what Jesus said to his disciples, the disciplined, the trained ones. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you, say it together, church, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Guys, Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior, the Son of God, he spent three years with his disciples. What did he do? He trained them. He corrected them. He coached them. And he loved them like family to the end. And after those three years, Jesus said, you're no longer my servants. I'm not even calling you disciples. He said, I'm calling you what? I'm calling you friends. Turns out friendship is the ultimate goal of maturity in Christ. Jesus says, if you're his follower, everything I learned from my daddy, I'm now passing on to you, dad. That's why you should never lose hope, mom. Because with Christ, it's never too late. So I like just get this right now. In a room this size with this diverse, some of you, my fear is you feel this internal guilt because you look at your parenting right now and you're like, oh man, you see all these gaps and mistakes and say, man, I wish I knew this back then. Or maybe you have a son or daughter who's rebelled or run away. Do not fall for the lie that it's too late. It is never too late to fight for their heart, amen? Remember, when you sin or rebelled, you pushed away from God, did he give up fighting for you? Never. Think of the prodigal son. He disrespects his dad. He disgraces his family. And what does his father do? He watches out the window, scanning the horizon. And when his kid comes home, what's he do? You got a lot to pay for. He wraps his arm around him, hugs him and kisses him. He corrects him with compassion. A robe on his back, a ring on his finger. He restores the relationship and says, this son of mine, this child was lost. And now he's found. That's the heart of your father. God specializes in restoring relationships. So I guess as your pastor, I just want to say, it's never too late to ask for help where your family has problems. And that's how I want to end today's service, by inviting those of you who maybe you're facing some family challenges right now to actually come forward so we can pray for you as a church. As your church family, at the end of the service, we want to come alongside you and ask Abba for his help. To bless you, your kids, your grandkids. So I'm going to invite our campus pastors, our prayer teams forward right now at every campus. Come on down. And they're here to pray with you and for you. So maybe you're here today and you're like, man, what timing, man? I got a crisis in my family. Or maybe you would like us to pray for someone who's not even here. 
me tell you, there's no relationship the Lord can't redeem. Just come forward and we'll pray for you as soon as I finish my prayer. Let's bow our heads right now. Let me bless our congregations. Father God, I thank you for being our perfect Abba. There is nobody like you. I thank you, Lord, for your infinite patience with me, with Colleen, with us. Lord, we're just imperfect kids trying to do our very best, but we need your help, God. And so I pray that you would send the Holy Spirit now. Father, as men and women come forward with different situations, different problems, crisis with children, Father, I'm praying for prodigals who have turned away from you, God. Would you lead them home with an Abba heart, a Father's heart? Father God, would you let us be firmly grounded in your truth, but Lord, opened armed in our grace. I pray your blessing on the Parents Summit, that it would connect dot and just dots and unlock, Lord, um, challenges that we think are insurmountable or too complex. God, nothing is too much for you. And so I pray, Father, a blessing on our parents, on our families, the marriages, the kids, and the students, Lord, here. I pray that you'll do more than we can ask or imagine according to the power of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you were blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.